Hello, good evening and welcome to the Ethics and Governance final webinar for semester two, 2017. My name's Courtney, most of you have seen me around now for the 10 weeks, but if you're new to Knowledge Equity, welcome aboard. I hope you find tonight useful. If you have any issues in tonight's webinar with audio or video issues, please the monitor chat uh, mailbox is inquiries at Knowledge Equity, so quickly send a message there. If you missed last night, we ran a boot camp and exam, uh, sorry, an exam preparation webinar. So the recordings there, the slides there, and I went through sort of the five key issues I've seen where people have made big mistakes in their CPA exams. And that's from my experience as a CPA examiner and marker over about 20 semesters. Tonight, what a wonderful feeling seeing the, uh, the timetable show the final week, module five, week 10, it's passed very, very rapidly. And uh, it shows that if you're systematic and in order, you hit week 10 and you're feeling at least comfortable or okay, hopefully not panicked and stressed. So let's see how we can go tonight. So the preparation for tonight, uh, look, there was quite a long video clip, so most people didn't really watch it in full, but a few people have looked at it. So I hope you found it useful because it shows you the severe implications, ramifications of what happens when people make unethical decisions. So we don't, when we outsource overseas, it's not just that there's actual people who are affected in those situations. And these decisions are being made every day. Accountants are involved in, if all we do is talk about dollars and we don't talk about people or the environment, we're not going to be valuable contributors. And we're gonna lead you know, people down the path of some pretty inappropriate decisions. The future of accounting is moving towards accountability, corporate accountability, especially environmental accountability but also social factors. So having a look at this practice question, what happened here and why did it happen? And can we stop it from happening again? So the aim was to have a look at this, uh, this video or documentary and then compare it to the ideas of table 5.2. So it was a balance between uh, theory and practice. So it made a little bit more sense. And then what I was trying to do is, can you apply it? So there are two types of exam questions I'm asking here. One is, this is application, which here's a case, which CSR theory applies. And then this is more of a exploration and explanation to show you understand it. Can you say, is it ethical or not based on a particular perspective? So you can see how I'm pushing you towards being able to answer exam type questions. <coughs> So the first, uh, if people want to type in the chat box, if you've had a chance on this, you know, stakeholder can just be um, one, two, three, and four. Stakeholder, legitimacy, institutional, enlightened. Evaluate whether it's ethical. So with stakeholder theory, would it be ethical to outsource this type of work to, to places like Bangladesh? It's not just the outsourcing, it's outsourcing to someone who has demonstrated that they are not looking after the social welfare of people. So. No one seems to want to be typing an answer to that just yet. So maybe you haven't had a chance to, to study or prepare it in, in enough detail. And a couple of people are preparing an answer now. So, so for a stakeholder perspective, is it ethical? From a legitimacy perspective, institutional and enlightened self-interest, yeah, everyone's too tired. It's been a long week and most people don't like module five. Uh, let's see, a couple of people are typing. So I'll, I'll start with stakeholder then. It's it's unlikely, depending on, on what's taking place, to, to outsource it. Outsourcing by itself is fine, but as I said, not when there's not safe structures in place. Because one of the things that happens is when you outsource textiles to a developing nation, it actually helps lift the wealth of that nation and lift them up out of poverty. Countries like Thailand, Japan have done this, the Philippines, moving up and up what we call the value chain and we see some big improvements. So mostly no, although some sort of outsourcing is okay. Legitimacy is sort of, at the moment, it's a bit no, when, when the terrible things happen, when there's a catastrophe, that's when people are a little bit aware of what's going on. But a lot of the time, the community's happy. Why? It's a bit like uh, when Nike was in a bit of trouble for having sweatshops and slaves making shoes. Well. People like shoes, they want to buy cheaper shoes, so they're happy to get the product. But once they become more aware, this idea that it's ethical to do this kind of work disappears. And because of legitimacy, they have to improve, so not really. And uh, 
you know, someone's mentioned with stakeholder theory that linked to safety risk, definitely. Someone's also said not ethical as uh, did not consider the stakeholder, definitely. Uh, institutional, if in one sense, everyone's doing it, but with enlightened self-interest, as someone said, except to, uh, it's ethical to outsource the work. It's going to make me richer because it's going to cost me less to get the job done. So I hope you can see that's a kind of, now if you, you could write those answers out, so it could be a written answer or it could be some kind of difficult multiple choice question. Now with uh, question two, which CSR theory? This, so this is more like a multiple choice, A, B, C or D. If it's an accord on factory and building safety. I'll give you one moment to answer that. few answers rolling in. It can be a bit tricky because if you haven't thought about these theories yet, haven't spent much time in Module 5, it's hard to remember it completely. <coughs> so I'm going to say it's institutional. The idea of if, if the non-government organisations can get some clothing companies to sign up, then the other companies will be forced to follow suit. They will have peer pressure put on them. They will want to do what everyone else is doing and therefore institutional is the right theory in this situation. So as I said last week, we've made it to the end of all the module objectives, which is a great feeling. And this one here, the sub subject objectives number eight, is the nature and role and importance of corporate social responsibility, hence the focus on accountability. Uh, yeah, that's right. Someone's just typed an institutional theory by norms. As I said last week, why do we have this focus on corporate accountability? Because there's been massive environmental abuse in not just developing nations, but um, fully developed nations have also done significant harm to the environment. We've uh, emitted a lot of pollution, we've released a lot of waste, we've consumed a lot of resources that cannot be replenished. And so over time we say, this is terrible. We bring in new regulations to clean up the air, to clean up the, the water, to clean up the, the land and we get improvements, but then abuses still happen. So we get these declines. Now, hopefully over time, we're still getting better and better, but you will see more and more regulation keeps coming in. For example, cars, lots of regulations around cars and their emission standards. A lot of regulations about you know, the price of carbon and emitting pollution that are pushing organizations to improve their environmental sustainability. So last week we looked at these key factors, what is CSR, what is sustainability and what are the drivers. Then we touched on the ethical links, which we looked at in that question. And then tonight we'll finish off by looking at reporting and new methods. So the key objectives you're going to be examined on are here. Uh, objectives 1 to 10, you can see I collapsed 1 and 2 and 4 and 5, 6 and 7, 9 and 10 together. But if you read through these, you can start guessing your exam question. And this is what I normally ask people, what percentage of your ethics and governance exam should be linked to module five based on the exam rating? There we go, 15%. <clears throat> so 15%, 85 marks, gonna be 11 or 12 marks. It could be 10, it could be 13, it could be multiple choice, it could be written, but that's, that's what we look at. So we're gonna get about 12 questions across 100 pages. So very, very difficult to know where to focus and across 10 objectives. So maybe one question per objective, or you might get two questions here, and one question here, a couple of mandatory, non-mandatory. Uh, this is probably worth a question as well. So we know you're gonna get questions here, but it's hard to remember it all. So I would say index it really well, maybe put some tags on module five especially, because there's so many new words and complicated concepts. So there's nine segments in module five. So, you, you know, there's about 10 objectives. There's going to be 11 or 12 marks and there's nine key areas. So first of all, what is accountability? And you've got to keep thinking about the word accounting and what we do. We give an account of the resources trusted in our care as part of our stewardship role. So when we give that account, it used to be a financial account, but now it's also a holistic account, our environmental, our social, our governance, our impact on all of the stakeholders. And this is why I keep saying it's the future of accounting and this is the future of your career. Accounting roles are going to get more and more broad. They're not going to be pure debits and credits. They are going to be all about this holistic examination. So I hope you like 
this module because this is a lot of you will be doing work in this area. So then we have the drivers of accountability. Uh, given the large weighting of module three and four, uh, can you, ex yes, more often than not, you're gonna get written answer questions that cover at least module three and four, but you'll notice that one question can easily cover multiple modules. So an ethical dilemma can cover module two and five, but a lot of companies have governance and ethical dilemmas together. So I would say definitely there will be some level of written on module three and four without a doubt, but probably two and five as well, and even the tail end of module one. So we have an increase in accountability, and then we have to say why, why has this happened? And normally it's significant events. Humans, like boiled frogs, don't notice small changes, but we do notice catastrophic events, and that's when we change our behavior. So environmental accidents, uh, you know, things like uh, the Bhopal disaster or the, um, the Alaskan oil spill or the Deepwater Horizon, that drives change in behavior very different. If there's a tsunami, if there's a, a massive flood or a hurricane, then we think about it, but we don't think about small incremental change. Then we have to change the whole concept of accounting in terms of the accounting entity concept. We're saying we also have to look beyond the organization, not just at ourselves. That's the ethical theories then we looked at earlier in the question. Here's the trick though, and this is the hardest thing. This is why the accountants are gonna spend their future here. How do you measure environmental factors? How do you measure social factors? How do you measure strategy and risk? It's totally different to dollars and cents, much, much harder. So that's why there's, at, at the end of the study guide, all of those different voluntary reporting techniques, GRI and uh, true cost and all these other factors are all trying to figure out the right way to measure and the right way to report. So there's some key limitations on financial reporting and we wanna fix that with all of these improvements here. And we finally conclude with this expansion to learning how to account for nature, natural capital, land, air, soil, all of these things which are critical to our long-term survival. So I hope, I, I spend a bit of time here because there's nine building blocks to module five. Hopefully you get one or two quest, questions on each block. And as long as you know each block, you've tagged it carefully, you should perform well here. So objective one and two we looked at last week. So just to quickly summarize, sustainability. We still have to meet today's needs, but we need to have leave enough resources behind for future generations to meet their own needs as well. From there, accountants' roles have gone beyond financial to also include environmental and social and governance factors. Jumping from objective one, the next part of the study guide looks at climate change, and we talked about this in detail last week. So <coughs> disruptive weather patterns, I talked about the, the floods in Houston and the hurricane that have been hitting in these category fives. These factors are causing significant trouble higher temperatures, less ice and snow, high sea levels. And so key factors that we've got, climate change plus waste, we've got you know, huge amounts of waste, and so not only waste, but resources that are depleted because there's nothing left, they have been fully consumed. Pollution and biodiversity. So these are key, four key environmental sustainability issues. Of course, whenever there's four or something, that's perfect for a multiple choice question because you're gonna be asked, which of the following is most relevant, one, two, three, or four, in accordance to a particular case. So what about sustainability issues in relation to social factors? Here we have child labor, and, and this is a big issue in developing nations. And if you watch, do you remember the module two video clip we put up on the uh, tobacco farming and the children who are touching the tobacco leaves and getting nicotine poisoning, terrible headaches, and are getting treated incredibly poorly. Then ethical trading, what is the right way to do business? And that ties in with module four, all of that stuff about uh, consumer protection, avoiding misleading and deceptive conduct, not lying about things like cage eggs versus free range eggs, not lying about things about your product features and whether they work or not. And then supply chain management, which sounds quite boring and very practical, is this, as the picture shows, the collapse of this building, if you're outsourcing to other people who have no OHS, who have no safety mechanisms or care for their people, then you are part of that ethical problem. This needs to be monitored and improved. 
So the theories of the organisational motives, we talked about stakeholders, legitimacy, institutional and light and self-interest. And I'm guessing you'll enjoy practice exam two because we, we do cover these. We, we do a bit more in, in practice exam two on module five, just to really test you and push you in this area. And the, these key concepts, so self-interest ties into module two. Stakeholder theory, it's important to remember the difference between these two. Normative stakeholder theory is about genuinely caring for all the stakeholders and trying to do the right thing. So this is what, we, you know, a nicer version. This one is not such a nice version because it's more about figuring out the power balance. Who's a powerful stakeholder? I'll go and be nice to them because that will be good for me. It's very self-motivated. So you only look after someone if they have power as well. Uh, someone's just asked if I can go back to those four theories again. So yeah, I'll do that. Uh, just give me one moment. So what we've got is stakeholder. Stakeholder is this idea of the nexus of relationships. Instead of just the shareholder here and the, and the company here, it's saying that there's a broader range of stakeholders that we have to work with. So that's what we, we've got to look at. So then we have legitimacy, which is about getting legitimacy in the eyes of society, in the eyes of the government. So what we need, for example, when Volkswagen totally cheated on all those rules, they lost legitimacy. If someone does too much negative stuff, like Anderson, if you remember Module 2, when they did some terrible quality audits and they got caught out and companies went bust, they lost their, their license to operate, their social contract got destroyed, and therefore they had lost their community approval. So that's where legitimacy comes from. Institutional links to this concept of doing what everyone else is doing, copying your peers, copying your competitors, and then enlightened self-interest is just about making money for the owners. Everything else is secondary. So there's different explanations. For example, why, why would someone do corporate social responsibility? So in one sense, people, a cynical view, I do corporate social responsibility because it makes me more money because people like me more. If you do corporate social responsibility because you have to, to keep your social license, that's a little bit more cynical. If you do it because you genuinely care, that's a really positive description. So I hope that, that helps make it clearer. Institutional theory is probably the most complicated for people. I've never seen it before. So coercive is when a powerful stakeholder pressures you to do something. Now, the government can do this sometimes. They can put pressure on you to act in a particular way. Otherwise, they'll take action. And you'll, you'll notice this in module four. We looked at gender diversity and how many women are on the boards of ASX companies. Now, what's happening is if, if companies don't appoint women, pressure is put on them in the media, in the news, they get written about, they get pressured and pursued, they are coerced into changing their behaviour. Other companies don't need to be pressured. They, they look at everyone else appointing women to the board and they go, I'm going to do what everyone else is doing. I'm going to mime, I'm going to copy them. And then what happens is over time, this becomes the normal approach to doing it. So norms push people to say, let's do what everyone else is doing. Let's not be different. Let's not look weird. So that's how institutional theory can lead to changes. But you do get this decoupling, which I, I did talk about last week, formal policies and actual behaviour. So you can see how module five ties back to all the other modules. We talked about a Commonwealth Bank. In module one and module two, Commonwealth Bank, you know, I told they, they aspire to high levels of ethics and they have wonderful ideas. But then when it comes to practical reality, they were helping people get away with money laundering. They were being incredibly unfair with insurance policies with people who'd had heart attacks or died or become incredibly sick and they refused to pay. They had um, their financial planning arm had misled people and deliberately gave recommendations that made them poor and lose their money. So the gaps grew between formal policies and actual behaviour to the point where the chief executive now has left the building or is, is in the process of leaving and they've just had to announce selling off their insurance arm because it's lost its license to operate it. It's no longer legitimate. People did not trust that company to do insurance. They're like, why would I pay you money for insurance when I know you won't honour your side of the bargain? So they got destroyed because of lack of legitimacy and lack of good governance and because of 
decoupling. So I hope that concept makes sense for you now. So what are the components of a CSR report? <coughs> Excuse me, and the limitations. So we have this growth in reporting to get away from just the minimal parts of financial reporting and its problems there. <coughs> so in the study guide, there's two pages of sort of definitions. So I would make sure you summarize those in your own words. You can collapse those two pages into just two paragraphs, but then every five days, just read over it again. So in the exam, if you see any of these sort of fancy words, you're ready for them and you know what they mean. So if you see natural capital, natural capital reporting, integrated reporting, you will be prepared. If you see integrated thinking, don't panic. Integrated thinking is not very complicated. It's just saying, don't just think about the dollars. So think, think about money and the environment and social factors and governance and risk all together. And I would say that's what a good manager should be doing anyway. So accountants are helping the managers just do their job like they should have always been doing. So don't just get caught up in the dollars. Think about everything else as well. So what's driven accountability? Climate change is driving this. Stakeholders, especially governments and community groups, are no longer tolerating companies who are destroying the environment. They say that is no longer acceptable because climate change is dangerous. It's going to hurt us and it's going to be costly to fix. There's also drivers because as competition grows amongst businesses, you know, for example, Amazon is coming to Australia. Everyone else is getting really nervous. They're going to have to improve and be more accountable. They won't be able to get away with things they used to because Amazon's way too competitive. Uh, we had Aldi come to Australia, so Woolworths and Coles have had to become more accountable because they used to make tons of money, but now there's pressure on. The global financial crisis and markets and ethical failures have driven accountability, and we cover that at the end of Module 1. So if you remember the end of Module 1, all of the factors that harmed our credibility and what we're doing to restore that, so things like lack of audit quality, lack of independence, that's driving uh, accountability. And then the idea of establishing a brand, brand and reputation. If you're known to be ethical and socially sustainable and you have a good product, well, everyone's going to want to buy your stuff. Uh, yeah, look, it is very confusing. It is quite complicated. We've got these theories of why people behave in a particular way. Then we have drivers. So drivers, another, I guess what we're saying here is 20 years ago, there was no textbook on this topic. So why is there a textbook now? Why is this being studied? And th this is the answer. This is the reason the textbook got written, because the environment got ruined, because the market financially co collapsed, because competition is growing, and because people have realized good social brand is powerful. So I hope that helps. Four good reasons pushing accountability. Uh, and to go into one of these, so there was four on this page. So incentives to maximize wealth. What are some specific examples here? Well, capital can easily, if, if I don't like Australian companies, they're not, let's say they're very good or well run, I can just take my money and invest in the United States or Europe or Asia. So if you're not performing well, companies will pull their money away. So you have to improve your behavior or the money gets pulled away. These days, People on Facebook and Twitter and everything else, if, you, if you're doing damage, 10 minutes later, the whole world knows. So you can't hide anymore. So that's pushing more accountability and controlling risk as well. So BP, when their uh, horizon, like what a horizon explosion in the oil, and then they found out all of the, the shortcuts they'd taken, that has cost them billions of dollars. And that's why their brand and reputation was destroyed, their risk management wasn't done properly, and Instead of saving a few dollars, they lost billions of dollars. So to avoid impairments on land that you've corrupted or made toxic, to avoid plant write-offs, to avoid uh, toxic inventory and greater liabilities, you are going to do the right thing, not because it's the right thing, but because it's too costly otherwise. So I hope that, that helps make it a little bit clearer there. So there are two main ways you can think about why do we do business? And one is the shareholder is why we exist. So companies, companies exist to make money for the shareholder. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is irrelevant. And so 
this professor is saying shareholder primacy. What does primacy mean? First, uh, primary, the top. So the shareholder is the top. Now, if you remember in module three, we have the Western model, the shareholder model, the Anglo-Saxon model. That's this side. So this ties into module three as the idea of governance in most Western countries is, is allowed the shareholder to be the most important. Everything exists to make them money. But if we move towards the relationship side, so remember this is also called the insider model, relationship model. Um, the Europeans use it, the Asian uh, countries, East Asia especially, use the insider approach. So the social contract. So it's saying that while you're supposed to try and make a profit, all the other stakeholders are just as relevant, just as important. So there are two ways of thinking about how business should be run, and that influences the laws. Now, at the moment, the law heavily supports the shareholder. You're allowed to run your business to make profits for the shareholder. That's the focus. Worrying about the employees, the suppliers, the customers, the environment, everything else is secondary. So these two perspectives. Bit of a question, not an easy one to uh, give you something to focus on. Give you just a few more moments because it's quite a long question for you to look at there. And what I've done is taken some pretty detailed case facts. And a few people picked A, B, C, no one picked D, which is that's all right. Uh, but what we've got here, the move from voluntary to mandatory CSR is not, so that, that's a key thing to keep an eye on. So these things have actually happened, but they are demonstrating more of a move towards corporate social responsibility. So in Europe, they're looking at more disclosure of non-financial and diversity. So that's corporate social responsibility. In these stock exchanges in these countries or, or cities, moving towards sustainability. But here, this is actually described in the study guide as the a focus only on the profits of the business and the shareholders come first. So this is the weakest one. The um, section 172 uh, also is moving away from pure shareholder primacy towards caring for a broader range of stakeholders. So in Australia, we're probably the furthest behind of everyone uh, in, in a lot of the discussion in terms of protecting stakeholders. We are still shareholder primacy, but if you look at these other ones, they're moving towards the stakeholder approach. So you can see the law is being dealt with here. So the next main uh, concept is quantification and monetization of narratives. Uh, and narratives. So what this means is quantify. How do we measure? How do we turn it into numbers? How do we make this work? Can we put dollar values on things like social and environmental? So that's the monetization. And this is the tricky thing for many accountants. How do we do narrative? How do we tell a story? And that's different to just reporting the numbers or creating tables. How do we explain corporate and social and governance and strategy and risk all together as one story? So here's a question for you based on this part of the study guide. Lots of people picking C, and I made it, maybe made that a little bit too easy, but hopefully you were able to quickly, easily find that in the study guide. That's an example of a find question, a little bit easier than what you would expect on a CPA exam, because all you have to do is go to the page, have a look through, and you can kind of work it out. 
Although all of these will actually affect economic results because if your customers are satisfied, you should get more sales. If your employees are satisfied, they're probably happy with the product and the service and everything else, so they will give good customer service. So they are interrelated. So what is measurable? If we look at social or SROI, so this is an, a good place to be asked a question, multiple choice or written. What is the social return on investment? Well, we need to look at human rights, the impact on society. Is your product helping or causing damage? Uh, so things like you know, alcohol and tobacco or drugs are often considered you know, the impact here. What are your labour practices like? Are people getting a fair wage, a living wage? Can they survive on it? There's lots of places where they're growing coffee or chocolate where there's not enough money. There's places in the United States of America where people do not earn enough in an hour to pay for all the food and everything else that comes with it. Environmental, what are the materials we're using? So what water, what air, what uh, physical components are we putting into our products? And what's coming out? What are the emissions, the effluents and waste? And we look at this a lot more in contemporary business issues, especially in module two. So we, we try and measure the quantities in and out, not just the dollar values uh, and our transport costs as well. We, we, when, whenever we transport something, we're going to have an environmental impact as well. Then economic, the market share, quality rankings, employee satisfaction. So these are all the different areas we can measure. You can see it's a lot more complicated than just income statement, balance sheet, cash flows. More complicated, but it paints a clearer picture and you can see that the accountant's role is just getting bigger and bigger as a result. Uh, we, we didn't cover these last week. So we, we talked through these, these topics at the start of uh, last week. I've caught up to where we were and then I'm just continuing on. So components of the CSR reports and limitations. So now we're into that next section of the that section five, the limitations of financial reporting. You can just type A, B, C, or D or E. Couple of Ds, couple of Bs. And we do have long-term focus here. So one of the, the keys here, Financial reporting is too narrow. It only looks at dollars. It doesn't look at the impact of what's going on. It doesn't look at the long-term sustainability or cleverness of your strategy either. But other problems, recognition criteria are linked to the accounting entity concept. So they ignore externalities. If you discount liabilities, you can make your long-term liabilities very, very small by playing around with your discounting rates. There's a great example in the study guide on that. And then the accounting and city concept, I mentioned that very similar to recognition criteria, it ignores externalities. It ignores all those costs that you push onto other stakeholders and onto society. So yeah, the focus is on the short term. So when we do financial reports, we're looking at what just happened now. We're not really considering what's gonna happen next year or in five years time. So some key limitations. The scope of reporting is too narrow. We need to broaden that to consider a wider range of factors. Our assets and our liabilities are linked to control and the entity concept, so they ignore externalities. Discounting of cash flows often leads to underreporting of long-term liabilities where you've polluted something or there's a toxic site that needs cleaning up or a mine that needs to be rehabilitated. The other thing is reliable measurement. It's very, very difficult to do a sound and effective measurement for many uh, parts of the income statement balance sheet. So how do we fix these limitations? Well, the annual report used to have the income statement balance sheet cash flows in a bit of discussion, but a strong financial focus. The move is how do we get integrated thinking taking place? Well, if we go back 20 or 30 years, we have this idea of corporate social responsibility reporting, or it was called triple bottom line reporting, or environmental reporting or sustainability reporting, lots of different names. And we normally had an annual report here and a CSR report over here. They were seen as totally different things. But what do we want? We want integrated thinking. So we start pulling them together and saying, oh, our social factors, our environmental factors are actually linked to our financials. There's an impact there. So they got 
brought sometimes into the same report or stuck on the end or discussed together, but they weren't integrated. <coughs> Excuse me. So the next stage, and this is evolving now, is integrated thinking, integrated reporting, where the whole story is combined tightly together. So you don't just say, here's my financial result, environmental. So think of the words triple bottom line. Triple bottom line has your economic statement, your income statement with a bottom line, social and environmental. So you can see they are not integrated, they are separate. What an integrated report does is pull this all together. And we looked at integrated reporting a little bit in the question last week. So mandatory and non-mandatory factors, let's have a look at that now. Another quiz for you. And the purpose of this is to show you there's a bunch of different rules and acts. And in your exam, you can be asked very specific direct questions. It's hard to remember all of this, so you need to be able to tag it and find it nice and quickly. So let's have a look. So the Australian Emissions Trading Scheme doesn't exist anymore. So this one is linked to the National Pollutant Inventory. Now, what are your chances of remembering something like that? Very, very slim. So summarize, index, and tag your study guide so you can find it nice and quickly. And if you get a question like this that you have no idea on, the rule then is to flag it, skip it, go to a different question that you do know the answer to. Don't waste time on somewhere you, you might not get right and miss out on valuable marks like in your written answer or something you do know the answer to. Make sure you skip. So the different types of mandatory reporting, compulsory reporting that's happening. We have the Australian Corporations Act and accounting standards. So a lot of that's our financial reporting. And we looked at the Corporations Act in module three, all the requirements that things like you have to produce a financial report, an annual report. Then in module three, we also looked at the ASX Corporate Governance Council principles and recommendations. Remember the, all the principles, eight principles and 27 or so recommendations that we have to follow. And that includes things like uh, continuous disclosure, making sure people are ma maintain the information flow in a timely manner. Now we get to the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act. So that gets very specific and there's some detailed tables and requirements there. The National Pollutant Inventory, the Energy Efficiency Opportunities Act, and as another example, the European Union Emissions Trading Scheme. So these are things that are mandatory. So you can see the accountant's role is already growing with things that must be complied with. Something nice and specific for you. So and if you're not too sure on what scope one, two, three, and four are, don't, don't worry too much. It just gives you a prompt of where to go and read in your study guide how to investigate further. So a couple of people have answered, a couple of people are thinking, maybe you've got the study guide out and you're checking your way through. Is there a scope for that? Might, it might be part of the, the twist in the check. Let's have a look. A few people are typing their answers now. A few A's, a few B's. So scope one. These are Imagine it like this. So scope one is stuff that you emit, right, your, yourself from your own sources. So if it's you in your factory, that's where it comes from. Scope two, in this case, is the correct answer. So your first level of emissions are from what you emitted yourself. But then the next thing is when you've got an electricity generator, they have to generate uh, electricity, give it to you, and that's going to lead to emissions. Then we have one step further away, everyone coming to and from your work, air travel, waste disposal, when you outsource up and down your value chain, other factors. And as someone picked, does scope four actually exist? No, it doesn't. So you wouldn't want to pick that in an exam. So here, just an extra bit of note. So that was my way of explaining to you the, the three different scopes as related to reporting here. So some specific guidance. And this is uh, straight from the study guide, but you could get a question on the facility threshold versus a corporate threshold, and you can look at the years. So this is the most relevant year now. 
So if you are emitting these amounts or more, then you fall into a reporting threshold. You have to report. So you can see the accountants are busy at work capturing these non-financial but quantitative measures, and they have to report them in an effective way and comply with the government rules and the government regulations. So have your, once again, you can't remember all of these things in the table, but if you tag it and you know how to find it quickly, any question you get on reporting thresholds, turn to this table, figure out if it's facility and corporate, and you should be able to get that answer correct. <coughs> Excuse me. So cap and trade, this idea of how do we push people to do the right thing? Well, ethics and guilt, and I mentioned this last week, don't really work, but financial pressure does. So as people start reporting this pollution and we start putting a cost on that pollution, what you will start seeing is, and, and this is the picture is someone being given a gentle nudge until they behave. And uh, if they don't, then, then they're off the cliff. So some more examples of emission trading and reporting. The NGER, the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Scheme. So in Australia, large corporations. So who needs to admit large corporations? What do they have to do? By October each year, they must provide this information. Voluntary or mandatory? There we go, it's mandatory. What about the European Union uh, trading scheme? So this is what we've got, 28 EU members plus Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, large organisations, annual self-reporting, mandatory. So you can see this move towards mandatory reporting. And the study guide sort of showing you that this, you know, if you read this in five years time, CPA will have updated the study guide and there will be more and more and more mandatory reporting as this becomes stricter and evolves and grows. <coughs> Excuse me. Another question for you. Just kind of keeping you diving through your material. This one must be too easy if everyone's picking the same answer. So in this case, we've got different types of reporting. You might have heard of equator principles or sustainability accounting or true cost or GRI. And then this is where if you have an index and each of them with a brief explanation will be quick and easy. So if you get a true cost question, you'll be able to find that. Which the following is based on a model used to calculate the quantitative environment across, across organisations and supply chain. So it's looking at the organisation and then that organisation will buy things from people uh, further back in the supply chain and it will sell things to people down the supply chain. So it's much broader than just the organisation itself. So some other non-mandatory reporting. And, and this is why this module is much harder to summarize and explain than all the others, because it's just a whole long list of information. You can learn about equator principles, accountability AA1000, the UN Global Compact, OECD guidelines, carbon disclosure, GRI, true cost, GHG, greenhouse gas protocols. And but each of them is just a list of information, facts, rules, recommendations, guidelines. It's, it's hard to pull that into a big theme other than voluntary are all in a fight. They're in a fight to be the best. So over the last 30 years, CSR has been evolving and different techniques have evolved, triple bottom line, sustainability reporting. Now we have integrated reporting. And as they evolve, more and more people choose different ones. So if 10,000 companies all decide to follow this approach, that will become the new standard. That will become mandatory, and maybe a couple of others will disappear off the list. GRI at the moment is very, very heavily um, populated and funded, and people really like it. You'll notice it in contemporary business issues, for example, it's, it's covered in a lot more detail. So some of these are gonna be more successful than others, and the successful ones will become mandatory, and the unsuccessful ones will dissipate and disappear. Uh, my best recommendation here, write some summary notes of each of these non-mandatory reports, maybe one paragraph each, put a tag on your study guide for each topic. So if you get an exam question, quickly turn to that page and then you can answer it. Yes, yeah, so everything on this slide is voluntary or non-mandatory. The, the earlier ones, like the government reporting, were examples of mandatory reporting. So if we go back a little bit, 
you'll see here these ones on emissions trading were mandatory. So the study guide talks about mandatory and then it goes on to talk about voluntary after that. <coughs> Excuse me. So then it's saying, what is the next step? What's current, currently going on? SRI, socially responsible investments. And this is where we go beyond just investing to make money, that sort of shareholder primacy approach to saying, what is good for the environment, for social factors, for people? What's good for, for society to eliminate poverty? You might have heard of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They are investing in things like, how do I eliminate malaria? How can we get rid of tuberculosis? How can we reduce AIDS? How can we deal with these long-standing problems that kill millions of people a year? Socially responsible investing. So SRI explicitly, you know, directly names and says ESG is really important, as important as the money or even more important than the money. Um, Thomas just asked, do you need to know the voluntary and mandatory reporting in detail? Yes, because it's an open book exam, you need to be able to answer a question on any of those questions. You, you will most likely multiple choice, but it could be incorporated into a written response as well. So what types of SRI do we get? We start off with traditional. Traditional reporting is not really SRI. It's more like just you try and invest, but you don't invest in things that are really, really bad. So a lot of people will, they won't invest in alcohol or gambling or tobacco or military equipment, but everything else is okay. So traditional is more like getting rid of the worst of the worst. And then responsible is the next step up where we start saying, well, let's not just look at what's bad and cross them out. Let's try and find those who are doing a good job, who are pushing forward with genuine improvements. Then we start looking at those who are the next level of sustainability and improving, followed by thematic. Thematic just means themes or investing in particular areas. So you might want to invest in, in improving water in a particular area so that more people have access to water and that leads to economic growth. So your focus might be water or it might be healthcare or it might be food and nutrition or it might be um, <clears throat> vaccines. So you can choose a particular theme or it might be food. I, I know of a farmer I met who was working in Africa and his theme of, of investment and gathering funds was on acacia trees. Acacia trees help grow very fast and they push back the desert. So they're trying to plant a row of trees literally at the bottom of the Sahara Desert to reclaim that land and push the desert back rather than let the desert encroach on the land. So that's thematic investment. And finally, impact investment is like the purest version of SRI. This is where people are willing to invest and not even make a real return. They are happy to give up the economic benefit because the impact on poverty reduction, on health, on food, on nutrition, on hygiene is so valuable. So it's kind of like um, philanthropy in a sense. So philanthropic investments, impact investments that are socially responsible. So you could get a question here to you know, write and discuss what types of investments are being made. You could be asked to classify a case study. So, you know, a company might be investing in a particular way. Is that thematic or sustainable, traditional or impact? And you need to know those definitions. So the last part of the study guide looks at natural capital. And economists have actually been doing this kind of accounting for a very long time. So it's not brand new, but it is new for accountants. And think about air. Air is not on your balance sheet. It's not in the income statement. Why? It's super valuable. Without it, we die, I don't know, within about three or four minutes. But we don't treat it as all that valuable. We pollute the air, we pump out emissions. And the reason it's not part of our accounting is because it's external to our business. It's sort of free. It's just there. We consume it, we chuck it out without even thinking about it. But how do we value clean air? What's it worth to live in a clean air environment versus polluted air? And we can see this when you see the number of people who die every year because of air pollution. So, and it's in the millions around the world from diesel, from coal, from all these other factors that get into our lungs and cause breathing difficulties. So it is very valuable and we sort of don't know how important it is 
until it's polluted. Our soil, our ability to grow crops, especially in Australia, salinity, too much salt, uh, eliminates the value there. So once your soil loses its, its soil uh, ability to grow, it's devalued. Water, absolutely critical and often wasted because it was too cheap. But you know, clean drinking water, being able to use water in production, you'll see this with uh, you know, growing food and producing products, it's needed all the time. From there, biodiversity and the ability for, for crops to grow and, and society to operate. The, the value of rocks and, and the foundations and, and sources of energy, so geology, and finally land. So all of these areas need quantification, monetization, and narratives, if you remember those three key things, to discuss, to explain, and to bring together. So any, any questions on those topics there? That would be um, that would be cool. Biodiversity. So biodiversity is uh, the, the width and breadth of all of what's going on in nature. And if you think about this, most humans today eat wheat or rice or maybe potatoes. But in hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, there were many, many more choices. There were all these different types of grasses and foods and, and things like that. But as we have um, started farming and picking the most, the things that grow the fastest, everything else has been left behind. So um, that's part of a lack of biodiversity. Other things like bees are required to pollinate so many different crops. So if we don't, uh, if we lose the bees, which we are, a huge amount of pollination of crops won't happen and they won't grow. So we're going to be missing out on food. And when we have our rainforests and, and things like that can help regulate temperatures. So there's all these interactions in the environment that we don't fully understand. They're like insects. You know, no one likes insects and mosquitoes, but they actually perform a valuable role. If you kill the spiders because you don't like spiders, you get too many insects. If you kill the insects, you don't get the pollination or whatever else that they are responsible for. So everything is intertwined and needs to work. Uh, same in, in, in the oceans. If you kill apex predators or, or the larger sharks or whatever, then you get problems as well. Uh, so, yeah, getting extinct. Could mandatory reporting take a compiler explain approach? Uh, some of that might. That's a great question. I'm going to have to think about that a little before I talk to it further. But mandatory reporting when it's things like greenhouse gases or things, that there's no compiler explain there. It's just you must follow this legislation. The, the compiler explain is more when you go into the, the voluntary stuff, the integrated reporting, the GRI, factors like that. So at the moment, it's not uh, mandatory is not normally comply or explain, but there is some flexibility. For example, accounting standards, you still have a lot of choice between which standard you choose and then you get to explain that choice. But you still have to comply with the accounting standards. Yeah. All right. So that pretty much brings me to the end of module five, but I want to leave some time for some questions. And, and just before I do, I have, I have one more, I have two things to, to announce. One that hasn't been so good in the last couple of days and one that we think is, is pretty fantastic. So we've, uh, we had a couple of bugs with our website on the weekend, if anyone uh, saw the message in Facebook or the email. On Saturday, it went down for about two hours and on Sunday, it went down for about three or four with some intermittent blips. So there's a demand issue on, on the website. We've upgraded the server and, and we haven't experienced this before. So we're still trying to isolate the cause. And uh, we're, we're doing our best. We hope it, it works well. We're resetting people's exams. We, we are very sorry because we know it's a week from exam starting and you need this time to get on. So all I can say is we've got the team working on it flat out trying to fix this. Um, one of the things we're suggesting, we're going to do some uh, maintenance at 6.30 tomorrow morning which means no practice exams to be sat from 3 a.m. onwards. We're hoping everyone's going to be asleep at that point. And so, but we are not sure how strong the website will be tonight just because it's been a little bit unreliable. So if you can delay your practice exam until Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, then that would be great. If your exams are this Saturday and Sunday with CPA and you really need to do your practice exam, well then please go for it and but and we'll monitor it and try and keep things working. But if you can delay a couple of days, that would just be fantastic. Um, that will really help us manage um, 
this and, and minimize any more problems and disruptions. So yes, if you had problems, we're resetting your exam. Uh, we're, we're just doing our very best to, to get it fixed and, and that's where it's at, but if you can hold off. So the next uh, thing, yeah, what we've said, hold off just for a couple of days on your practice exam and don't start a practice exam from 3 a.m. this morning uh, because we will then, after that period of time, after three and a quarter hours has passed, we'll do the, the maintenance then. We, it might be safe for tonight, but we, we're not fully sure. We haven't isolated the problem yet. So my recommendation, if you can wait till tomorrow night or Wednesday or Thursday, that would be great. Um, we, it's worked all day. People have been doing exams. Uh, we've never seen this problem before, but give that a go. So more exciting. <laughs> it's always a little bit awkward to announce this uh, as we've had a little bit of trouble. But uh, with boot camp, yeah, if you haven't started, yes, there's a video for all 10 sessions. With boot camp, you watch each weekly webinar because they're all recorded. So you watch week one through to week 10. It will take you 10 hours. If you do one per day, that's, it's, you're doing two, two modules, sorry, you're doing one module every two days with boot camp, that's wow. Um, when the exams are reset, no, you, you can't continue from where you left off. We haven't been able to make that work. So what's happened is we've had to do a, a reset in the back end and then you have to start again. Now, if you're right at the end of your exam, you might want to go through quite rapidly just to get to the, the answers, um, but that's where it's at. Okay, so this is what I get to announce. And normally it's a really positive time. It's been slightly awkward, but, but here we go. With the... Uh, ENG, we give it away free. We hope you really like it and we hope that you've enjoyed your CPA studies and you want to stick around. So what we do, we not people normally sign up around December when the results come out, but we want because that's and that's when we open our site for studying. But we want to encourage more people to sign up a little bit early and we want to reward those that do. So if you'd like ethics and governance with us, then uh, what we're doing uh, is we have what we call early bird prices but we, we're going early, early bird, even better than that. So exam ready is our subject that doesn't have, this is the resources without the live webinar and full focus has the live webinar. So full focus normally 495, exam ready normally 350. But what we're going to do is do exam ready. So if you, if you like the subject, but you don't need the live webinars, it's 325 <coughs> and if you want to come to the live webinars with the practice exams and everything else, 375. So we've discounted that quite a lot. And uh, yeah, less than half the PDL. That's that's one of the reasons why we keep it there. We want it to be um, fantastic value. And then just to, to say thank you for the people who want to jump in early, we, we're going to do an extra $30 off. Um, but we've, we've set that coupon to only work 100 times. So uh, that's, yeah, that's less than 10% of ENG students. So we're, we're over, over a thousand now, which is just fantastic. Over a thousand students studying with us and the first hundred get, get the reward and we get, you know, by signing people up early, it gives us the money to invest in new resources and, and whatever we're doing. So my encouragement to you is go to the website, check it out, and hopefully the website's working really well. Uh, this is the link here. So you, you, at the moment, you just choose what's called a value pack. And it just sits there as a credit on your account. Then when your results are out in December and you choose your next subject, you tell us and we put you straight in. Um, you can use it in semester one or semester two or whenever you want. So, so that's what we've done. Uh, so someone just asked, is there an MCQ average for practice exam two yet? No, there's not. Um, most people haven't done it yet. Heaps of people have done uh, practice exam one, but not. Oh, you've already bought a two pack? That's, uh, that's fantastic. So you haven't missed out. Um, yeah, if you buy, we also sell two packs, three packs, four packs, five packs, and they get cheaper all the way. So if you want to get um, your full focus for under three hundred dollars instead of five hundred dollars each, you can buy a, a five pack. Um, if your exam is on Tuesday the seventeenth, I would say do the exam tomorrow night. Um, but also send me an email, and I'll make sure I mark. I'll prioritise the marking of that so that you get the feedback promptly. Yeah, so let's do that. Uh, so that's the, where we're at. The, uh, the last thing, if you need to email me, eg at Knowledge Equity. If you have any issues like getting into our website, please use the inquiries email. We're watching that carefully. Okay, if your exam's on Monday, no problem. Uh, tomorrow night and we'll, we'll mark that and get that back to you on time. 
Oh, fantastic. The 23rd is excellent. You can wait till all these bugs have washed through and we'll go from there. Uh, tomorrow night after 6 would be perfect. Yeah, I'd, I'd really encourage you to wait till tomorrow night after 6 p.m. would be great. We're pretty confident we'll, we'll solve the problem, but it's always frustrating when you can't isolate the, the direct cause, especially when there's so many people trying to get the work done. Okay, we've just hit 8 o'clock. So uh, I am, yeah, if, you're on, if your exam's on Saturday, then then yes, you can you can try and do it. I'd say go for it, we'll give you the feedback. If anything happens, we know it's an issue and we apologise in advance and we'll do our best to fix it quickly, uh, as quickly as we can. We, we haven't seen this before in five semesters, but these things happen and, and we'll, we'll work it out and uh, do our best. All right, uh, I'll, I'll stay in the chat box. Um, but any more questions? Oh, if you've got the PAX exam today, yes, you'll get the feedback. So if you did PAX exam today, you get the marked paper back by Friday, definitely. Um, please give you some tips. Uh, I will. Oh, let me get, shall I go back to the coupon? Most definitely. So it's EG Lock, as in lock in the great price for 2018. Uh, can you take PAX exam two this Saturday? Definitely. Um, can I give you some tips for the exam? Yes. So if you watch the exam prep webinar, I used to be the chief examiner for about 10 years, about 20 semesters, and a lot of students don't like the written answer, and that's a massive mistake. Make sure after two hours, no matter where you're up to in the MCQs, go and write the written answer, because otherwise that's 25 marks. If you get zero on that, your chance of passing the exam is very, very low. Um, thanks, Simone. That's, oh, thanks for the wonderful feedback, and thanks for buying the, the five pack. Um, yeah, so yes, but you can do the practice exam two on Saturday. Uh, manage your time. That's the number one thing I can recommend. Number two, tag and index properly. And when you do our practice exams, practice good technique. So by the time you get to the CPA exam, it'll be your third time sitting down for a three hour and a quarter experience. So you'll be, you'll be prepared. You'll still be pressured and a bit stressed and a bit nervous, but you'll kind of know what to expect. Yeah. All right, so I think I've captured all the all the questions. Uh, oh, you're trying to purchase a two-pack. At the moment, that we only activated that coupon for a one-pack. Um, uh, but if, if you want to do a, a two-pack, uh, no problem. Let me, if you just email that, I've got someone monitoring that and they'll be able to sort you out straight away. Um, can we have access to the webinars from next month? What we have to do, what we'll do at the end of October, at the end of the semester, is we, we shut down the site and we update the resources, we look for bugs, we fix some questions, whatever needs to be done, and then we release it again as soon as results are out um, because that's when people sign up for their next subject. So it gives us a bit of time because CPA often update the study guides, they're updating tax, we think they're updating financial reporting. So it means that we can get the new content up for you. Yeah, that's what we'll do. So, all right, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but uh, I'll, I'll stick around for a couple more minutes to answer any questions. But otherwise, I, I hope you've found the 10 weeks that we've covered useful. I hope we've helped keep you on track. I hope you've watched the short videos first because we think uh, watching the videos puts a picture in your mind, helps you understand the materials. Uh, I hope you found the questions and the quizzes we've done give you good feedback as you're going. And uh, <laughs> So I'm just doing and I get the discount if if I WA. <laughs> You'll have to explain that a little bit further. Um, uh, the mid-semester test has been taken off the whole system. It was only available for those 10 days, but the practice exams are available. So um, oh, I should say that. What's the next subject you should do? SMA. So you should do ethics and governance, which is all about compliance. Remember module three? Compliance and performance. SMA is the performance angle. So you get some balance. And a good accountant can comply with the rules, but helps a business make money. So we say SMA next, and then either contemporary business issues or financial reporting. Yeah, so definitely SMA. Um, FR is a good option. The jump from ENG in difficulty to FR is significant. So we normally say do ethics and governance, do SMA, maybe even one more. Really get a handle on budgeting your time. FR will probably take an extra 40 hours of study compared to ENG to get a similar result. So as long as you're ready for the step up, yes, you can do FR, but um, ENG, SMA are a little bit more on a par with each other. 
Any tips for tagging the study guide? Yes, I think um, I, I just use post-it notes with keywords written on, but I prefer to write an index as well with um, page numbers attached. Can I play to drivers of accountability? Oh, corporate identity. That is referring to like your brand and your perception in the market. If you are perceived as environmental and efficient and sustainable and honest and full of integrity, that will add value. Customers will choose to come to you because you are preferred. So because the most popular brands are normally the most ethical and the ones doing the right thing, that is driving, accountability is driving more and more people to be more accountable because that will improve their brand. It will make people like them more. So I hope that, that makes sense. Uh, can you get a discount if you wait for your result? Uh, you, uh, we'll, we'll have a look. Um, I'll see what I can do. Send me an email. And uh, the problem is th this is still a massive discount. So 375 is is normally what people will pay if they wait for the result. The extra, we've really only capped this at the first um, 100. So I'll, we'll see what we can do. All right, uh, I'll, I'll be here for two minutes monitoring the chat box. Uh, Weekly webinar will be there till the 28th. Yes, so all the resources are here until you finish your ethics and governance exam. So uh, fantastic. All right. Couple more questions that have come in. Um, did I did explain the drivers? I hope. Can you just confirm? Because I did explain the drivers of accountability. Um, so did that explanation make sense? I was talking about the push towards a better brand name, towards customers preferring um, those who are environmental. So therefore, you be more accountable because your customers like it, and therefore you get more revenue, more sales, more profit. Uh, so let me know if that makes sense. Um, cool. Uh, do you normally see an improvement in score in the second practice exam? Yes and no. What happens is our second exam is a little bit harder than the first. So you do the first exam and it's in module order and the, the, the questions are a little bit easier um, in the written answer. So what happens is you get better with your studies, but then we give you a slightly tougher exam. So normally the results are, are virtually identical, but it's it's actually a better score. It's like a scaled experience. Exam two is tougher than exam one. So even if you've got the same number, I would say it's probably three to five marks harder. Yeah. So, oh, thank you, Afiris. That's a great feedback. Uh, if your written answer didn't get uploaded, um, email inquiries at knowledgeequity.com.au. You, you would still have a Word document. So please email that through to inquiries and we will put it into the marking process. Um, we don't have a full summary, but if you download the webinar slides from the 10 weeks of webinars, you'll see that I actually have each of the pictures or graphics, we have lots of flow charts, like attributes of the profession is summarized on one page. Uh, we do the same with the code of ethics and things like that. So you'll probably see the, the key areas I discuss in the weekly webinars and in those slides will give you the key topics that, that are covered in most detail in the study guide. Yeah. So, all right. I think I've answered nearly everything. I think there's one more question coming through. Um, yes, if you, you can buy a two pack, three pack, five pack, you can use them whenever you want. Um, as we add more resources and grow, we, the prices have gone up. So it's, a, it's an opportunity to lock in the lowest possible price ever. So some people use one in one semester and one the next. If you defer for a semester or take a semester off, that's totally fine as well. Do we get short answer on module five? Yes, uh, when you get to exam two with us, you will, and you might in the CPA exam, definitely. Um, will we have any more webinars? No, so we've done 10 weekly webinars, but there's also four webinars in the winter school um, area. So I go into ethics in more detail and trade practices law. And there's also a boot camp webinar and a exam prep webinar. So there's about 14 recorded webinars altogether. Um, CBI and SMA, yes, they go together beautifully. So CBI is, is, SMA is about how do I value in the business as a management accountant, and then CBI is like broader concepts and topics which all link to helping the business perform better. 
So CBI, SMA, and then Global Strategy and Leadership, those three go in sequence, and FR and audit go together, and tax kind of stands alone. Yeah. Cool. SMA is mostly theory, but a little bit of practical. So it's not the same as undergraduate. There's a lot of theory of performance measurement, a lot of theory about how businesses create value. A lot of people will, um, so I wrote uh, module one of SMA and helped to write and wrote the case study module. Some people will say that module one is a little bit too theoretical, but they want more practice. Then there's a little bit of calculation in appendix one. Module four, there's a lot of activity-based costing. Uh, and module five has things like net present values and residual values, earned values. Um, if you know you don't, you don't have to buy the full focus now, uh, like the subject. You just buy um, a value pack, is what we call it. So you buy the value pack, and then it just sits there, and you tell us what you want to do in 2018, how you can allocate that. So yeah, cool. 